a very short uh, uh, presentations of uh, uh, four governance five projects uh, and go for you across in gov and glass that are the four projects that were uh, funded together with interlink and then we have uh, the etap as also project that is a very important project also h2020 project uh, represented today at the end, we will have a Q&A session that will be moderated by Professor Diego Lopez de Pina of University of Deusto, Spain, an important partner of the Interlink project. Okay, so quickly, I will quickly go to the Interlink project, just a few minutes, uh, just to, to show you what we are talking about. So why interlink? So the governance five uh, uh, topic was a very complex topic. And in fact, uh, you will see because in fact, these five projects uh, are all quite different because the, the topic was really complex. Uh, it contained a really a lot of elements and we focused them on uh, this challenge. So uh, that governance is being transformed there are new approaches to delivering public services, which allow for the involvement of citizens and various other actors. So we focus on this part of the topic. And the challenge is to critically assess and support this transformation based on an open collaboration and innovation platform supported by ICT. So this is the, 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 what we focused. And uh, our reasoning was the following. The, the current situation was that there were kind of two forces uh, coming together. One that is uh, uh, about uh, uh, the top-down, let's say, approach. Much effort has been spent by the European Union and member states in developing regulation, procedure, technical solution for interoperability and reuse of software to enable a EU digital single market. However, we have all these very strong, very complex approach that sometimes they do not involve uh, small companies and small third sector organization and create outcomes that are very good, very technically sound, but sometimes they lack transparency and trust. On the other end, we have another, let's say, force that uh, uh, we can call do it yourself government where non-governmental actors, such as third sector organization, carry out activities, sometimes in place of the local administration. For example, there are a whole bunch of uh, European projects uh, in the Collective Awareness Platform Initiative, I think 20, probably each 2020 projects, that try to do this, sometimes in parallel with these other uh, 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 more traditional, let's say, uh, e-government projects. And these approaches, however, suffer uh, from several limitations, in particular sustainability, accountability, and legitimacy. So what if we combine the strengths of these two approaches to overcome their individual limitation? And this is the idea of interlink. So uh, innovating government and citizen co-delivery, so we focus on this co-delivery, and we want to overcome the barriers that prevent administration to reuse and share services with private partners, including citizens, by developing a novel collaborative governance model that merges the enthusiasm and flexibility of this grassroots initiative with the legitimacy and accountability granted by top-down e-government framework. So our first output uh, means to provide a first list of high-level socio-technical requirements that will be used to guide the functional specification of our set of what we call interlinkers that are building blocks uh, uh, that provide software tool uh, or uh, let's say uh, partnership enabler. But let me go to this figure. So what is interlink in a nutshell? So we uh, want uh, public administration, citizen and private entity to collaborate, to co-produce a service. So you see the interlink in the top interlink service instance. And what we are producing are the three uh, real, the, 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 the output are the three box. So interlink collaboration environment, that is where these three actors collaborate. And interlinks that are technological enablers and partnership enablers. So we want uh, 
technological enabler to allow the services like i don't know a, identity management uh, a, and so on but also partnership enablers because this third sector organization should be guided also in non-technological stuff like for example templates uh, forms and so on and then what we want is to produce a customized service that will be also co-delivered by public administration and these actors. And that's it. This is uh, my five minutes uh, saying what is interlink. And I will let uh, Taco Bransen, Professor Bransen, uh, then go to, into the depth and details, uh, and then Paul, of course, about what interlink is about. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to be here. And uh, please go on. Thank you. Good morning. I will share my screen. I will try to. So, uh, 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 to. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm having some problems with sharing. We didn't uh, practice this. Can you see my screen or? So. Um, I can't seem to share my screen, sorry. Can... Would it help uh, if we start with Poli and then you try to solve your technical problem? Um, sure, no problem. Okay, let's try this Let one. Let me switch the two presentation, <laughs> okay. Can you see my screen? No. Ah, sorry. Right now. How about now? No. No? Yes. OK, delay. <laughs> OK. OK, let me put the full screen mode. Is it OK? Thank you, Pauline. Yes, you can start. Okay, uh, I will uh, start uh, with, with the talk about uh, how to co-produce technical solutions for public services. Uh, Taco was supposed to talk about our overall co-production process in details, but we, we will do that a bit later. So, my name is Pauli Misikangas. I come from Finland. Uh, I'm the CEO of, of a small company, Klavenska LTD, uh, focused on software development, especially algorithmic solutions, and uh, in the Interlink project. My roles are focused on co-business and co-exploitation models and also technical development. So the co-production, we see it is, it's a kind of funnel. So uh, if you check the funnel chart in the left side of the view, so starting from the top, there is some, some common needs and opportunities that, uh, that can be addressed. And, and the project starts with, with uh, initial preparations and engagement of, of teams and uh, going through the design and implementation all the way to the sustainable services in order to receive some long-term benefits after all. And uh, the, the people who are involved in this process, we, we have named them as a co-production team, so as ellipses in, in the middle. And uh, the, the fact is that uh, this team is evolving all the time during the project. So in the beginning, there are maybe only few original innovators that have this vision that they, they wish to implement and uh, they, they refine it and uh, introduce, uh, engage uh, more, more people to the team. We call them engaged developers that actually do the hard part, the designing and implementation and testing and evaluation about the solution 
But as a final phase, we see that uh, eventually there will be some dedicated maintainers that will take over to, to uh, continue maintaining the service. For example, if it's an actual software service or application or some other kind of uh, maintainable service uh, that, that are dedicated for the job and uh, make sure that the, the created co-created service is actually sustainable. And uh, in the interlinks project, we aim to support the work of this team by providing uh, a, a set of interlinkers, as mentioned by the Mattel, they are kind of enablers that, that enable cooperation and development and, and uh, so on. And uh, we have organized them into the boxes shown on the right side, uh, um, according to the, their main, main purpose. So there, there are, uh, these are called problem profiles, uh, so, so to, to recognize the common needs for these kind of teams, to, to organize uh, work, to understand the, the scope and uh, define the project and services, build the actual software or however it is built, validate that the results are okay and uh, usable and, and then for sustaining the overall results. Um, the overall core production process is, is pretty complex, shown as the process tree on, on the left side. And uh, it's actually so big and complex that it's, it's hard to visualize on one page. And therefore, we, we innovated another beautiful way to visualize the whole project as a core production flower, shown in the middle. And uh, so basically, uh, you will uh, hear about these uh, detailed phases of the project in Taco's presentation a bit later. But basically there are elements like uh, main project phases and the objectives related to a process phase, key challenges related to the objectives, tasks to be performed in order to tackle the challenges and uh, the support, uh, supporting interlinkers for the tasks. Uh, but uh, the overall process is still very complex. And uh, if we uh, aim to help these teams, we first need to simplify simplify and show them and uh, what's actually should be their main focus at the moment. So the co-production team uh, probably cannot uh, figure out the big picture, the whole process at the time. So therefore we are developing a, a helper called Interlink Wizard that uh, helps the team to, to, to find out what's actually relevant and useful. And, and uh, by doing that, uh, the, the wizard will uh, first of all prune out the irrelevant parts of the process uh, that are not uh, important for the team. Every every project is is unique, so so the whole co-production process is a kind of common process to to everybody uh, to fit all kind of needs. And uh, for a single concrete project, only parts of the process is actually needed. And uh, also uh, to highlight what should be the team's uh, next focus points in the tree and also kind of uh, uh, put uh, non-urgent topics on the background. So not to worry about them at the moment. So so to, to keep the focus clear and uh, simple. And also uh, important job of the wizard is to recommend which interlinkers, these enablers that can be technical solutions, software services, cloud services, software libraries, business model templates, uh, tools uh, for, for the team, which of them would be uh, useful uh, to, to handle the, the challenges that the team is facing. Um, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but the wizard is not based on magic after all. So it's based on, on actual human expertise plus some machine learning algorithms. And uh, I will quickly show what's the key idea behind the wizard. So first of all, the team need to recognize that they need some help. So they have some tasks or challenge they, they cannot uh, solve by themselves. So they make a help request and uh, within the platform um, with the collaboration environment, uh, the help request is, is either handled directly by the wizard or in this case, uh, directed uh, to a group of human experts that have volunteered to help on these kind of topics. And uh, in order to help them, they need to know something, uh, the key facts of, of the project. So there is a concept called project fact sheets, which is a list of known features of the project, known needs 
and the resources they have and skills they have. And in case some essential information is missing from this fact sheet, the human expert can write uh, questions that will be addressed and answered by the team and uh, their answer will be appended to the fact sheet. And this process goes on until all the information uh, required to uh, make actual recommendations is, is, is present. So, uh, so the idea is that this human expert uh, provides, pre-selects some of the process tree elements, some interlinkers as a kind of recommended options for them to choose from. And the team can then, then uh, amongst themselves, uh, choose which of them would be the best and uh, make the decision, which is of course uh, added to the fact sheet as well that these are the de team decisions so far. And the last final step is to use this information gathered in this uh, questions, answers, recommendation process uh, to train the wizard. So that uh, if later on some other project is in a similar situation, have similar kind of key facts on their fact sheet, the wizard is able to kind of uh, imitate the recommendations done by the humans automatically. Let's go back to the uh, First slide uh, and this co-production team. So as I mentioned, there are kind of three main uh, groups, uh, the innovators, developers, and maintainers. So let's check who might be in these groups. Of course, uh, citizens are important stakeholders in these kind of co-production projects. So uh, we see that most likely they participate uh, as original innovators. The idea for the new public service may come from the public, the, the citizens. And uh, some of the citizens may also uh, participate to actual development of, of, of the service uh, according to their skills and, and uh, uh, wishes. And uh, public authorities are, of course, uh, another possible source for, uh, for initial ideas for these uh, services. And uh, they are most likely also closely involved during the actual development of the project, mostly maybe kind of leading towards the right direction, helping in practical things and, and, and so on, shaping up uh, the service. And uh, there may be also some research organizations participating. And we see that most likely they, they are active during the development phase. They may do some research, background research for, for the service and uh, maybe uh, give them uh, advices for the team in, in that sense. But uh, finally, there there might be businesses, small or big companies that uh, participate also this project. Uh, mostly we see them uh, uh, helping in the actual development in case, especially if, if it's a case of software services, then probably they need uh, software profes professionals to actually implement the project. But uh, in, most importantly, uh, the dedicated maintainers are mainly comprised by the businesses. So because those are the ones that uh, that need to be committed to, to continue maintaining the service for the long time. And uh, businesses, if, if, the, if the business model behind the service is okay, they are happy to take that, that responsibility. And uh, one quick, oh, sorry, first. Uh, there are some kind of handover phases shown on the right. So from the original innovators through refining and reshaping uh, the process, they need to be delivered the vision of the service uh, clear enough to the developers so that they can actually start uh, refining it and actually designing and implementing. And uh, finally, when the service is ready to be released and taken into use, there is a handover of the whole service to the dedicated maintainers that may not have been uh, involved in the actual development, but uh, will take care of the service from that point on. on. And one quick question that we can discuss later in this, in this event is that why would they co-produce co anything together? Obviously, these are very different kind of groups shown here. So, so what is the driving factor that makes them interested in participating in this kind of co-production uh, activity? And we see that uh, co-production definitely requires co-business. We couldn't find any satisfactory uh, definition of the co-business co term, so we <laughs> defined them 
it by ourselves. So we see that co-business is something that emerges when a team of independent stakeholders work together towards a common goal to solve important real world needs, which eventually bring benefits to everybody involved and beyond. So put it in short, uh, any collaboration activity entered into for mutual benefit. So uh, from this perspective, uh, we, instead of making a business model, which is uh, should mostly be focused on, on making actual monetary profits, uh, we uh, kind of wrap this into a co-benefit model to, to understand uh, the, the key reasons for each stakeholder group why they would be interested in participate. And we have recognized at least these uh, main benefit types uh, uh, to be present. So some may be uh, participating because of personal benefit. They may, may learn about the project. They, they see it as a kind of fun hobby projects or, or something, or they, they are potential end users of the service. So they need the service and therefore help creating it. Uh, some may participate because of the society benefit. They want to do common good, uh, do something that they, they believe to be useful to a wide audience. Uh, the governance benefit, something that uh, helps to run the city, for example, some, some useful thing that helps, helps to lower the burden of, of public authorities. Research benefit, uh, quite likely uh, these kind of projects, uh, there are some interesting research topics uh, in, in the background that, that could be researched, or uh, there could be even some research projects based on these kind of services that, that can be financed uh, to get the financial benefits for the research organizations. But uh, mostly there, for businesses, um, although the, some of them may have this uh, other kind of uh, uh, reasoning behind uh, participation, they mostly are interested to receive some kind of financial benefit uh, in, in the long-term cooperation. So uh, as a final point in my, my short presentation, I, I will name this key challenge, how to ensure that everybody shown here receives the kind of benefit they expect from co-production. So that's the uh, current uh, active uh, work we are doing at the moment in order to create a kind of comp co-benefit model and, and practices that should ensure that everybody who participates receives some benefits eventually. That was my uh, short talk. Thanks for listening. I will now uh, leave the stage to Taco. Thank you. I will Now, yes. Do you have it? Can you see it? I hear nothing, but I assume that you can uh, can hear me. Uh, thank you for your patience, and thank you, Pauli. Um, we will now go step back and say why why co-production in uh, um, in services. So, what I will talk about is first uh, what exactly is it uh, uh, Pauli already mentioned some of it what the f project focuses on why we think co-production is so relevant to uh, designing public service delivery and finally the first glimpse of what we call the co-production map that shows how stakeholders including citizens can be involved in the design and delivery of public services at various points of the process now, first, the focus had to, to, to define uh, what is the area which we focus on. That's public services. And we define that broadly in the sense that um, not necessarily that public authorities realize them themselves, but they are committed to realizing them. So if this is done by, say, a network of businesses, citizens, uh, third sector, that is also fine. Uh, public authorities need not be the central actors, but they should be committed to realizing them. That's important. Second, uh, we, there should be a digital element to the services that we look at. It can be a fully digital service, but it can also be a, a, a human, a physical service that has digital support. And finally, and this is of course central to the project, there should be an element of co-creation or co-production. Uh, a lot of co's have already come by. I will have use the term co-production, uh, meaning that 
private organizations, citizens work with public authorities in designing or and or delivering services. Now, of course, the question is why? Why would you want to do that? Because it does complicate things. Um, but many technological solutions are known to fail uh, uh, because people are simply not simply they are simply not legitimate in the eyes of their users or other stakeholders who have to work with them people are not convinced there's a, so there's a graveyard of underused or unused platforms and digital solutions uh, uh, which which represents a colossal waste of public money uh, and sometimes that's because uh, the the technologies do not address the needs of users as the users themselves see them it's because they do not trust the people who deliver the services like the public authorities uh, a problem in many countries hi taco sorry to interrupt you could you yeah. please uh, put it in presentation mode because we are only seeing the the, the first slide in the powerpoint just just f5 it is in uh, presentation mode Okay. We are we are seeing the yeah there you go. Oh yeah. Now we okay, see the slide you are in. Okay. You didn't see the others or no, we didn't. Uh, uh, I have no idea why. Anyway, then we'll do it this way. Um so why is uh, as I said uh it's it's very important that technological solutions are designed to fit the needs of users and to get the collaboration of users. So you have to move from design for users to design with users or even by users eh, is imaginable. Eh, because in that way, co-production can assure that these are solutions that people actually want and that people will accept and work with. Eh? And that means you have to interweave eh, the social and the technical, the digital and the non-digital. Eh, um, you cannot have a separate process where technological digital solutions are designed and then handle uh, all the social aspects separately. This has to be integrated from the start. Um, so what the Inter Interlink project uh, does is help answer the following questions. If you're in such a process, when should you take which decision? Uh, and that ultimately should lead to the wizard that Pauli talked about. Uh, specific to the project is then the question, how can stakeholders, including citizens, at what points in these decisions should they be involved and how? Now, there is no one way to do that. Uh, there are several ways of doing that. Um, each public authority will make different choices there. Uh, the project is to help them in in making those choices, uh, uh, making those choices clear, and then providing the resources they need to make those choices. Uh, um, and this, these are the interlinkers. Uh, so let me, let, uh, um, moving to the next picture, uh, there are various ways to do this. Uh, um, once you get to designing a service by a team, uh, such a team will include technical experts, obviously, but it should preferably also contain some non-technical experts. Uh, we'll look at the social and human aspects of a service. That can include users, uh, citizen experts, who are active users or thinking in the design. Uh, of course, also the broader mass of service end users may be involved in some way. Uh, this can be done afterwards by letting them evaluate, test the design, or they can be involved, engaged in an earlier phase where they think about what a digital service should be about. So there are various ways to do this. Uh, and and um, the Interlink project is not about imposing any of those choices, but about clarifying the choices have to be made. And as I said, then supporting public authorities in making decisions there. Now, the next, uh, we've tried to visualize this uh, in um, this slide, um, where can you can you now see uh, this uh, the, the various phases? Diego, can you see this? Because I've put it in presentation mode again. Okay. Unless I hear anything, I assume that you can see. Uh, 
there are phases, as Pauli already mentioned, in this process. Normally, in designing a surface, you would have a design and implementation phase. We've added a few extra, because yeah? prior to designing a surface, you will have an engagement phase where you might involve various stakeholders in thinking about what is the actual problem we want to solve with this service, with this solution. Huh? And there are various ways in which you could engage them. Huh? After that, you go to a smaller team of actors who help actually design the service. Once that is done, huh, you go to implementing, to first launching the service uh, and seeing whether it works and whether it meets the needs of people. And then, and this Pauli already mentioned, you go to a phase where the service has to be self-sustaining, uh, where it has to be able to operate continuously. And then the question is, who will take care of that? Who will fund it? Who will manage it? Uh, and that might be a different team, a different group of people uh, compared to those who designed the service. So in each in each phase, you have to make new choices and create new teams of people who will be doing this. Um, we've gone further in, um, in making those choices. Yeah, I don't know whether you can see this slide. Uh, if you can, you can't read it because there are many hundreds of choices potentially to be made. This is the co-production map. Uh, if you would zoom in on this, and I hope you can see this, you would see that uh, there are various choices to be made um, along uh, those lines. Okay. To go into that a bit further, um, for instance, uh, what choices are we talking about? Uh, this is a very rough first uh, um, try at this. Um, for instance, in, in the engagement phase, if you want to think, okay, we want to consult involve stakeholders, but who should they be? That, that is not always obvious who should be included, excluded. So uh, um, if you want to include citizens, which citizens? How do you reach them? That is part of a first phase. Uh, um, need to clarify what is the problem we want to discuss with stakeholders? What, what are set choices we will make in a smaller team? What is questions we open more, uh, throw open more broadly? When that phase has been settled, um, then after each phase, there should be a go, no go moment. Like, is this huh, what we've come up with? Is this what we want to continue with? Huh? So there should always be an evaluation. After that, you get a design phase huh, where based on the input from the earlier phase, you actually go to designing a service uh, that has the technical parts, uh, which naturally involves technical experts, but also has this experts on the actual service, uh, the human aspects, what are the social requirements of a service? Uh, what do citizens want? Uh, and do we have sufficient expertise to do that? Uh, um, again, after that phase, you have to think, okay, is this the design we want to continue with? And who will pick it up in the next phase? Uh, um, when you get to the implementation phase, when you're actually launching the service, you get questions like, who owns the data uh, um, that are being produced, uh, generated by this service and necessary for this service? How to control that? Um, are there uh, accountability procedures in place to do that? After you've launched it and it turns out to be successful, then the next question is, the sustainability phase, huh, when you have to think very carefully, as Pauli mentioned, about who, who benefits, who, is, who, who benefits sufficiently to sustain the service. And then again, there's a question, the whole questions of ownership and management that apply then. So, to conclude, um, we believe that co-production is essential when designing digital solutions uh, in public services. Uh, it leads to better services accepted and legitimate services. So what we try to do through the Interlink project is to integrate co-production into the decisions you have to make about the design and delivery of public services. That's why we've started to develop uh, the co-production map and the wizard. The co-production map is now being developed, should be published in the first half of 2022. Thank you. Uh, Taco.
I think uh, now is the, the turn to switch to, to the other governance five uh, projects. So after having concluded this overview of interlink, both from the governance point of view as provided by TACO and from the more technological of how to actually materialize this co-production model uh, uh, in the presentation offered by Pauli, we switch now to uh, the, the first of the five projects that are related uh, to interlink and that belong to the uh, governance five uh, call. So we start with the NGOF for EU and concretely Robert Creamer is going to be offering us an overview about the project. So welcome Robert and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diego. Can you hear me well? We can hear you very well. Make sure that you share your screen, please. You can see not my screen. Okay. So that's okay. No, you can, you can see my screen. Uh, but try to share the screen. Yeah, I did. Okay, I will just share it again and then uh, select the right screen. So, yeah. So now it should work. Is that correct? That's correct. We, we see the proper one, so I leave you now. Okay, wonderful. Go. Good. So first, uh, let me thank all uh, of you for the invitation uh, to this wonderful uh, uh, exchange between EU projects, Horizon uh, 2020 project, I think it's a wonderful opportunity to really make sure that we learn from each other and that we actually know what the other projects are doing. I think this is a fantastic possibility and so uh, thank you for taking the initiative. So I'm speaking here on behalf of the mgaf for eu project, which is uh, the Mobile Cross-Border Government Services for Europe project. So we were in the same call, but we interpreted the call a bit differently uh, as you will see in, in a moment. But actually we see uh, several possibilities also for collaboration respectively also where we have similarities. So what's the core idea of our project? So we want to have a citizen-centric approach where we provide a bridge between the EIDAS uh, regulation and the single digital gateway regulation where we want to enable mobile cross-border government services for Europe. So essentially this is these three different, uh, different pillars. We want to actually mobilize in that sense the existing EIDAS interoperability infrastructure. We want to leverage the emerging single digital gateway layer and we want to develop a sustainable and extensible mobile government architecture. What impact do we expect? So we think that we will be able to provide a user-friendly mobile authentication with single sign-on and privacy preserving identity and consent management for cross-border e-government process. So we very much believe in this idea of the digital single market and actually creating services that will eventually drive the usage and really be able to, we are going to be able to use it in a user-friendly way and in the trustworthy federation way of collaborative platforms. And in that sense, we follow similar principles like your project with uh, the idea around the interlinkers on the building the bridge between the public sector and the private sector and we go basically this uh, one level further and also providing it in a mobile way. So we, that is a consortium of partners uh, from Technicon, our coordinator of ACID, uh, the Secure Information Technology Center in Austria, then Danube University, Krems in Austria as well. We have EasySec uh, company that is also working strongly on identity. We have Fraunhofer involved with GoEIDAS initiative, uh, initiative to sustain and to promote uh, EIDAS in, in, in Europe. We have CITL as one of our piloting partners and also running our piloting program with the University of Tartu, where I am from, so uh, which is the leading university in Estonia. And Estonia obviously uh, is, is known for its uh, approach to digital. And we then have Timelex, which is also involved in several of the other uh, research projects in our cluster. And then we have the Technic University of Graz also as one of the solution providers around EIDAS. So what do we want to actually do? I mentioned before our three pillars with the IDAS, with single digital gateway and our pilots. So essentially we are actually building on the existing EIDAS infrastructure, but as you're also aware, EIDAS is currently undergoing uh, a re rejuvenation uh, uh, process where in particular the idea around uh, uh, wallets is being discussed. And that's something which we actively want to take up and also consider what possibilities there are in our uh, solution to implement wallets. So we are not only looking at what has been already agreed, 
but we are actually also looking at possibilities for the future. And so we are going with the way that the European identity and authentication infrastructure is developing. And then we are really following the developments around the single digit gateway. We are actually building on the um, once only technical system that has been developed in, in previous projects that we were involved in, in particular in the top project, uh, and actually want to leverage this potential that the single digit gateway actually has in it, in particular due to the fact that the single digit gateway regulation mandates that by the end of 2023, cross-border digital public services in 21 areas need to be provided by member states of the European Union. And so really this idea around once only digital by default will drive our pilot through which we are actually going to uh, learn how to use our technology and our infrastructure. So uh, that brings me then actually to our three uh, pilots and uh, that's a slide after next, but maybe first, what is our infrastructure? So we are actually building a trust and discovery framework that on the one hand side will link the data providers, so to speak, the base registry on the one hand side and the services, the data consumer on the other side. And we're actually going to enable the identification of citizens and companies through the IDAS framework. And um, we'll basically combine these two technological approaches, which in most cases are complementary, but not in all aspects, and that is also our task to actually identify how to really integrate both of them together and how we can actually offer these services. If you think in particular around the issues of consent management and data preview possibilities, also from a mobile device. So back to our pilots of what I wanted to talk about before. So we have three pilots. We have an internet voting pilot where we're actually going to consider also a scenario which might not be there right now about transnational elections. So how could we actually enable a remote voting scenario for eventually an election such as the European parliamentary elections on how could we combine and reuse our data exchange layer for this purpose? So we actually have a secure internet voting solution that has been developed before and we're going to apply it together with the IDAS and mga 4 u uh, solution to actually ensure proper authentication, actually pulling voter registration uh, records also from another member state through our platform. Then we actually have a mobile signature pilot that will actually uh, take a very easy and very practical uh, user need, which we all have in our cluster, actually the need to sign a consortium agreement through a centralized platform. Uh, and so to have actually something that will support the IDAs and through a mobile a signature solution. So that is one of our uh, three pilots. And then we actually have the one that probably is the most uh, interesting also for you in the Interlink project, our smart mobility pilot, where we're actually going to um, provide a taxi service. So basically it's the 50-50 uh, app. So where uh, taxi users in a municipality will receive a subsidy in case they come from a certain regional location and we want to provide this authentication or this authorization through this supported um, identification of the user and authentication. So that is actually also the part where we are going to co-produce. So we believe very much into not only having uh, infrastructure that is available to the public side, but actually also the interaction with the private side, with private actors, and through that actually co-producing public value and this is where we are also going to explore the ways that this can be opened up, in particular through our pilot uh, with the smart mobility use case where public partners, local authorities will collaborate with private companies. And that's something that we will be exploring. So in that sense, we are very much interested also in your experience. And also thank you for providing that framework, Taco, earlier on. I think this sounds really interesting for us and also where we can build on previous work. Uh, in particular from you, that sounds very interesting for us and we'll be very happy to learn more and, and continue that uh, exchange with your project. And then actually where else we could see a possibility is actually learning more about your piloting, about your use cases, and then also see uh, what important practical experience we can learn from you in terms of involving private actors in this public uh, networks, public data exchange platforms. And with that, back to you, Diego. And I'm looking forward to a possibility later then to exchange also questions and other elements around this. Thank you so much. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Robert, for your clear presentation. 
uh, there'll be the opportunity to interact with you and ask you some questions at the end of all the presentations. Now we should switch to the ACROSS project, where, in this case, Enrique Arizaga is from Technalia organization is going to be offering the, the presentation. So, Enrique, please make sure that you share your screen. And once we can all see it, you, you can take over. OK. Uh, let me see if you. OK, number two. Do you see oh, do you see the screen now? Uh, yes. Okay. We see your screen. Then I will move to the presentation mode. Now we can see it also in full screen. So go ahead, Enrique, please. Uh, okay, perfect. Uh, so thanks, Diego, for the interaction. And thanks uh, for this very interesting uh, initiative. Uh, as Robert has mentioned, I think it's, it's very good for all the projects that we are working in e-government uh, to share the idea because uh, in, in most of the cases there are things that we can benefit one from each other uh, in this case uh, i will uh, present uh, will introduce uh, the concept uh, i mean the across project is probably will take uh, more than five minutes just to introduce all the concepts that we are working in but uh, we'll, we'll start like by saying we are towards the user journeys for delivery of cross-border services ensuring data sovereignty and i will explain what it means later First, uh, as you see across, uh, across is just, uh, it's like a sense of movement, okay? It's like uh, you are moving from one country to another uh, within Europe. And that's what uh, we did as cross. It's like we are going to facilitate the movement of uh, citizens uh, within Europe uh, in, uh, for, uh, and just taking care of all the difficulties that nowadays uh, they are experiencing where they are just moving, for example, when they are going for studies or we're going to, to work in, in a different country uh, within Europe. Okay, So that's uh, uh, what uh, we will do. Uh, again, we will just, uh, as my colleagues uh, Robert has mentioned before, we will also tackle the cross-border issues. And uh, when we talk about uh, is, uh, uh, of course, uh, we will tackle what is interoperability uh, within Europe. Uh, the main objective is, uh, it is described here, but I would just try to make it uh, more comfortable like by explaining uh, a couple of uh, studies uh, or a couple of, uh, I would say, uh, call services that we will implement in the project, which is the study abroad and the working abroad. Of course, we are not only limited to that. We have just focused on them because uh, we have made some kind of interviews. We have made the, the citizens participate and uh, they have provided their, their, their feedback, their concerns, and the concerns are mainly on uh, what uh, all the burden that they have to bear when they just move from one country to another. If they would like just to complete their studies in another country in Europe, or if they just want to move and try to start working and get a job in a, in a different country. And uh, so what uh, here uh, we have, we will work on a, on a platform. Okay, we have a methodology that we call the user journey methodology. And what we will provide, it's also uh, some tools, okay, that uh, it will facilitate uh, when you are just, uh, it will make an example when one student is moving just to, uh, uh, to other, another university, uh, you have just to go and have to go into this pre-qualification state. Uh, you have to apply to the university. Later on, you have just to, to go to get the accommodation, probably just to open a bank account, and also just to have to, to get some uh, European health insurance and all kinds of things. Okay, uh, This is usually takes uh, a lot of time. There are, uh, and uh, there is also a lot of material, a lot of data that is just uh, a change between uh, the user, the personal data, the university that she's coming from and the university that she's going to move. And all this data in some cases is not controlled. Uh, and uh, I mean, it also takes a lot of time. Most of the time it has to be manual. And uh, what we will provide here is tools just so this is done in an automatic way, and we have a virtual assistant that it will guide uh, this person on how to do that. It will collect the the data that is required from the different public services available in the different countries. And it would just move, uh, it would be like a flow, okay? This flow chart, just moving step by step so that uh, these uh, citizens will be assist and uh, in every step 
and uh, all the different data that this uh, exchange is done under the consent of the customer. So they would say the user will be in the center and it will have full control of what data is exchanged and uh, it will uh, give the permission uh, of what data he would like just to be exchanged or not, okay? Um, although we, we see here all the different things that we will provide. I mean, we, will, we will also provide mobile and web application. We have a, we will have also a service catalog where we will invoke, we will have a register of all the services that are available and how to invoke them. So that's we'll probably we'll talk later about also the synergies with other projects. For example, if, uh, if we like to use some kind of uh, uh, authentication, we can also just use the results for other projects or we can use the building blocks from the European like uh, EID or e-signature, e-translation, or many other things that are available, available there. So to, uh, probably, uh, well, we don't take much time because we're only limited to five minutes, uh, but uh, uh, if there is interest to just to go deeper into, the, into this, uh, we will provide the tools, we will provide the building blocks, we will provide the framework so that at the end, uh, we will try just to make it possible that every citizen move from one country to another uh, while everything is controlled, it is uh, with security and uh, the, uh, we call what we call this data sovereignty is, is the center point of, of the project, okay? So everything the user is now under control of his own data. So the partners that we, we have here is uh, starting from the, from the coordinator, which is ATC. Uh, I am from Technaria myself. So, and then later on we have uh, you know, like uh, uh, the ministry of the from Latvia, which is in case of one of the use cases, the Lisbon Council, uh, engineering from Italy this is a part of the more technical issue. WAG is in the co-creation, time legs from the technical staff, data power from Hofer, for both from Germany. He will also just be involved in the virtual systems and how the, also the use case in Germany and GRNet and GFOS for the, for the use case in, in Greece. Uh, so that, uh, but we will also just to, to come here on how we can benefit both from what we're doing across and what we think that Interlink and other projects in the government can also just bring to the cross project. So that, uh, as I tell, uh, we are not just going to, well, the idea is not just provide another platform, okay? Uh, so that uh, we compete with the, the ones that are existing. We don't, we think that it doesn't make sense that we compete with anything that uh, is already on the market. We need to provide uh, valid value, okay? So that was, uh, we will provide this like a tools, methods and techniques, and uh, we will just coordinate it together uh, so that we will just uh, make some implementation and, uh, and solve the results in the use cases, okay? So the key here, as always, it will be the interoperable cross-border public services complying with the current European regulations, and not, not only public services. Okay, we are uh, uh, remember that with some cases the, the user will need to open a bank account, or they will uh, just get to uh, get accommodation for a, a private company that is providing kind of services. So private services will also just be brought into the project. But uh, all the services that it will be included in the catalog, it has to be conforming to the the SGDR. And uh, finally, uh, we also just, we will make a lot of work on the personal data framework. And this is what I was just telling before, where all the personal data is under control of the owner. So where you, whatever you give the permission of what data uh, has to be used, when and for, uh, and for the time that is needed. And if, uh, if there is some data that is coming, of course, we will use the once only principle for public services, but then when, when data is just going to go to a third party or a private services, that is when uh, we will just, just to take care that there is a consent uh, from, the, from, the, from the owner so that this data is, is transferred only for the, for the service that is supposed to. So that uh, for uh, what we think that will benefit from uh, from the uh, from the results of Interleak. Okay, as I said before, I mean uh, we need that uh, more services are included into the service registry. Uh, okay, so it's, uh, if uh, somehow uh, there are more, we will open also a call for co-creation sessions uh, to define what uh, what services uh, will provide also value to this. Uh, to this movement of uh, citizens from one country to another. Uh, we already have identified one, but we, uh, of course, uh, and, and of course, as, as I said before, 
uh, we are under the assumption that by the, the end of 2020, everything will be, all, all services will be digital and conforming to the regulation. So in those cases, this, uh, the, the way that we will provide uh, to register and further uh, to be invoked or integrated into the into workflow or the flowchart that we have in the cross, it will be benefit all all all, uh, all the all the users, all the projects, and especially the uh, the citizens at the end. So that's uh, that's uh, uh, all from my side. Uh, I hope that I haven't taken much time for you or more than Diego suppose. So uh, probably Diego, back to you. Thank you very much, Enrique. It was a very interesting uh, presentation. Later, we will have the opportunity to, to discuss about uh, possible collaboration opportunities. So now uh, let's please uh, pass the floor to Elias Contacos from Unisystems. Uh, Elias actually has a double hat. So he's going to be talking first about the end of project, and then he will uh, talk about the glass project. So the floor is used for two consecutive uh, presentations. Elias, please, before I leave the stage, make sure that you share your screen yes. so that we can all see it properly. Um... Two monitors, uh, it's a screen, yes. Yes. OK, uh, it's coming up, so I'll I'll start. Do you see my screen now? Not yet. It's coming up. Bear with me for a moment. Uh, no, it doesn't. It should now. Now oh, I'm starting to it's see. It's coming up. So, yeah. Okay. Make sure you show it full screen, please. Yes, I will. Thanks for the for the introduction. Indeed, I need uh, I wear two hats. Without the hair is necessary, I guess. <laughs> but uh, uh, sorry, because I'll start with glass first, and then ego, which case since is the first uh, does make a difference. Um, uh, we stand here. I'm uh, coming from the the Unisystem SA in Greece, and uh, we have the the privilege to to lead two projects under this call. Uh, the one is what I'm going to present now, the glass, and uh, further on, uh, uh, the INCAV. So uh, I'll try to, to make it short so you, I won't be uh, uh, for a long time uh, presenting. Uh, glass is a, is a very uh, interesting project. It investigates uh, different um, uh, scientific methodologies. Uh, to basically help the uh, set the, the the citizen in the middle of uh, uh, what we call uh, service provision. Uh, usually, we uh, a lot of uh, us as Europeans we have try, tried to travel around uh, uh, Europe, and uh, we have come across with bureaucracy and borders. Basically, uh, within the the class, we try to to provide uh, a solution towards the. Uh, oh, it's, it's a bit of a. Uh, sorry, it's in a... now it's a bit of a funny presentation. I have two presentations. I made a bit of a mistake. Let me wait a minute. Sorry. I would like to, it's a wrong title here. So, one minute. Uh, this is what I need. So, no, I have too many presentations here. My apologies. It's something wrong went here. So, it's a. Uh... Oh, here is this. Sorry, my apologies. Um, so basically, the the project what it tries to do is to to provide a wallet based solution to offer the opportunity for the citizens to stand in the middle of service provision and decide where to uh, basically when and how uh, want his personal data to be. Uh, provided to to the to the counterparties that he liaises with. Um, uh, as uh, you see here, is uh, one of the expected uh, impacts of the of the uh, of the project is to uh, to develop the user centric wallet. One of the main challenges of the project also is that we are investigated how we can save the different pieces of information on the IPF uh, network. 
uh, using blockchain technology. So to make sure that the, uh, the, this kind of transactions are safe and, uh, uh, and uh, without any uh, possibilities of uh, providing the reliability for the, for the government uh, to, uh, to assess. Uh, the partners here we have uh, from different countries. Obviously, it's Unisystems. Uh, United the Kingdom is uh, participating with uh, uh, with AMA. Uh, it's Germany and uh, ah, sorry, it's also Edinburgh University from UK. In total, we have twelve uh, uh, partners in the project. Uh, very capable, all of them, to provide the solutions that we need because it's a very challenging uh, project technologically and in terms of uh, uh, of uh, of background knowledge um, uh, how we can uh, how we come in glass with uh, co-production uh, definitely uh, the glass bridge is the trust and the mechanism for public and private uh, partners to work together uh, at the moment, in a bureaucratic environment, we we tend to use stamps and papers that is easy to, to fake. Uh, with the glass uh, project, we want to to uh, to, to to go a, f a step further, provide solutions that uh, uh, that are very safe for, for transaction between uh, between governments and the citizen. And also, uh, we give the opportunity for the first time to test how the citizen will be to, to take control of, uh, of, the, uh, of his own information. At the moment, uh, at the background of uh, different services, there's exchange of information, obviously, without his knowledge. Uh, we like to, to, to put the, the citizen or business later at the middle of these transactions and uh, know where and when his uh, information uh, is uh, passed over to the uh, to the other counterparts. Uh, uh, of course, as I said before, is uh, that has a lot of uh, uh, influences because here we have to uh, to, to 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 work against uh, culture and uh, linguistics and uh, many other aspects that uh, to to make sure that the systems are working together. Uh, however, we we try with, through the glass. One of the objectives also is to harmonize all these uh, digital assets and basically uh, uh, provide the new framework on how this uh, um, uh, uh, how these services can uh, be provided without uh, hiccups. Uh, I will. Uh, uh, I will say, for instance, uh, one of the cases that we have is, is we investigate how criminal records can go from a country to a country because uh, one of the case studies we have is to to establish business in another in another country. Uh, this is uh, something which is uh, very demanding in in a sense, and we try to to find out a common language and a common background how this uh, th how a paper like criminal record which is a basic paper for many business transactions, can be transferred without uh, the need of translation or of uh, paperwork. So everything will go through the, the, the digital channel. Um, obviously, uh, the, uh, the, the, the glass has a, is uh, relevant to co-production in many respects. Um, because here, basically, you have another issue of co-production co uh, in, in terms of uh, that the citizens, basically, he's on the hold of his information and he produces, finally, uh, the, the piece of information needed to the, the counterpart that he wants to, uh, re uh, to affiliate with. So this is probably another, uh, another way to put... Uh, uh, um, uh, co-creation on the table. Uh, it's very, it's very demanding because uh, we have to change a lot of uh, background to that, as I said before. But on the other hand, uh, uh, we're very, uh, we stand, uh, we stand on our grounds, and we believe that we're going to 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 help also the and the commission and the. In general, the business making to to move towards a more uh, 
uh, a new reality in uh, service uh, public service provision. Of course, to this uh, to this process, we're not alone. We need to 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 receive and exchange knowledge uh, with other projects. So, to that ground, we are very much open to to do the sharing uh, uh, with the, the other project of the cluster, and uh, we are very much looking forward towards this direction. Um, Thank you very much. That's shortly about the, the glass. Uh, I have to to say here because the presentation was not made for for a multiple coordinator because we have a difficult task and we have two projects under the same call. We work together with uh, uh, Mrs. Anna Zoaku uh, to coordinate this project. And it's, it's difficult and complicated task. So. Uh, uh, please uh, keep uh, the name also uh, when you circulate uh, the information. Uh, that is all from uh, from uh, from uh, from Glass. Uh, you'll give me some uh, minutes to to move to to Ingav. Um, here it is. As I said before, I'm going to wear the next uh, hat now uh, and uh, present uh, the Ingov. Uh, Ingov is a, is a project uh, fully dedicated to co-creation uh, in many respects. Basically, it's the, at the heart of co-creation because uh, uh, what we try to, to, to achieve here is to uh, offer a new uh, integrated uh, um, uh, public, serf, uh, public service uh, um, a framework that uh, uh, on how co-creation can happen uh, in the uh, in Europe and beyond. Uh, we have a very very interesting team. We are going to see that a bit further, and uh, we examine the co-creation from many respects, as you can see here, it's in a multidisciplinary. And uh, it's not only theory and frameworks that we that we uh, we that. Uh, we do the the review at the moment, and we uh, we do the review, but also we exploit the uh, possibilities of uh, methodologies and technologies, like uh, virtual assistants or mobile apps that can be used and offer personalized, uh, secure uh, application with obviously uh, the ultimate goal, which is for co-creation, is to increase the value for the end users. Uh, I very much welcome all the discussions about uh, the, the previous uh, comments about uh, co-creation. I would like to add a little stone to this discussion, saying that co-creation basically helps us to, to increase value and take up, which at the moment we have a severe problem when we are investing on, uh, uh, on e-government projects. Uh, what the objectives of the project are, uh, as I said before, we're going to uh, deliver uh, and uh, basically we have done that uh, last week in a conceptual co-creation model. Uh, we're going to provide guidelines and recommendations. This is also uh, has delivered uh, about two, two weeks ago. Uh, and uh, we're going to move to a reference architecture blueprint to see how this uh, can become into uh, into practice. In uh, in short, uh, basically one can because we are very much very many academics here. You can uh, see us as a bit of a PhD research, which we we put the framework, we put the questions, and then we go back to the practice to see whether if these questions are good or not. So. In the project, we have three cycles of this kind of exercise in order eventually to, to come with uh, both with the frameworks and fine tune the recommendation that we'll be able to provide towards uh, the commission and pro to other stakeholders that we'd like to, to get a, that we engage and we would like to, to get engaged, engaged in, the, uh, in this process. Uh, expected impacts similarly is a taxonomy of the uh, uh, integrated public services co-creation principle a very good work has been done uh, in the first uh, semester of this year delivering a, uh, um, 
a deliverable, uh, very significant, that collects all this kind of information that was spread here and there. So this is, I really appreciate the team, the, the whole uh, consortium that has delivered this. Uh, uh, we'd like to, to, to see also, to, to see the way how increased participation governance uh, with added value services will come into life for both businesses and services. Um, and I would like to, to obviously to eventually after after the, the end of the, the project to, to put a little stone towards the, the improvement of take up uh, rates for public service provisions, which I repeat at the moment they are very low if we exclude tax uh, purposes. Uh, the consortium also here is uh, is very and a very interesting and very uh, dedicated consortium coming from different uh, countries. We have very good background uh, in terms of co-creation, but also the the technical partners are providing with uh, um, uh, uh, top uh, quality uh, uh, technological inputs. Um, also, I would like to, to put here that we have uh, the, the, the big challenge on, uh, on our project is to, uh, to face different kind of co-creation styles. So we have co-creation between um, different, uh, different uh, uh, players, stakeholders within the government, which is uh, the case of Malta. We have between the, the government and the business, which is the case of Austria. We have the, the uh, a case that uh, co-creates between the um, uh, between the uh, the government and the handicapped community uh, with pe people with special needs. That's the case of Greece. And finally, we have a, a bit more futuristic, so to say, a service in Croatia, where the the citizen would like to interact with the municipality. Uh, via chat box and find what is uh, uh, what is more important for they for them as uh, and how they can engage better in the uh, uh, in the issues of uh, of of the common issues of the municipality. Um, how we are going to influence the co-production? Obviously, as I said before, we have a holistic. Uh, we are going to provide the holistic framework for this process, and uh, which is going to work as a logical foundation and tool to utilize it and define the concepts for for how this process will happen. Um, at the end of this uh, very interesting uh, journey, we would like to be able to provide. Uh, the guidelines that will be useful, not theoretical. Uh, we had a lot of discussions during the, this uh, almost first year, and uh, we saw that despite the fact that a lot of frameworks are, are established, the the, uh, the clearance to the to the ground when uh, where the most of the uh, uh, e-government. Uh, 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 activities happen, uh, then uh, they, don't, they don't have any understanding of what these frameworks means to their real life, either, even if we talk for interoperability of uh, other kind of uh, framework. So we need to have uh, clear uh, guidelines to help people and engage in this process, both from the government, business and uh, the citizens, to engage this co-creation uh, 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 process. Of course, uh, next to it is going to be a roadmap of how this will happen. And uh, uh, I would like to, by, by, by practice, as I said before, we'd like to feed in and uh, finalize and provide at the end of the project uh, this uh, uh, helpful, uh, helpful sorry, uh, framework uh, for, for both the European Commission and but also for uh, for all those engaged in co-creation activities, uh, collaboration. Obviously, in terms of co-creation, uh, INGAV is more significant in this discussion. I would say than Glass. Glass also has a co-creation input. Uh, is a bit uh, in a different context. Um, we are looking collaboration here too. Uh, we have done a lot of uh, already a lot of workshop 
to understand the process, to to present our ideas to different uh, uh, to different audiences. With uh, the peak uh, moment, I would say for the uh, last October in uh, uh, in the ICGOV uh, conference, we we organized and presented. Uh, all the background of uh, of uh, uh, of Ingav, and there we received quite a lot of uh, interesting comments and feedback from not only European but global uh, players. As as you know very well, ASIGOV uh, conference is a global international uh, conference for e, e government. So we. we 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 are open and we are uh, willing to to exchange this uh, informations and uh, help all the cluster to move forward as as everybody knows uh, clearly that the co-creation is is the big one of the biggest buzzwords in the e government uh, for the next uh, programming period and of course apart from the, the importance of the buzzword it's very important to see eventually applications that matters to us uh, with this I, would, I close down and uh, again uh, i would like to to thank uh, anna that she's not presented here due to the format but uh, she's uh, very helpful and very into this project so that is for me thank I give you Elias, a... for for your two wonderful presentations so now we finish covering the projects regarding governance five and we switch to roberta lotti from med she's going to be offering a presentation about the etapas project which covers uh, some non-functional aspects some cross-cutting aspects which are core uh, for the adoption of public services so, Roberta, please share the screen. Thank you, Diego. I'm trying to... No. Okay. You can see my screen? Yes. Let's see. We can I can't it. see it. I don't know why. No, I see a black screen right now. Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, that's the problem. Okay. I try again. Okay. Share screen. Window. Oh, I can see my window. Sorry. Have my screen. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. I I don't know which is the problem. Because it all seems working but okay i'm here okay so share screen share screen okay this screen no what's happening you can yes, see we see the presentation, oh, not in the presentation mode, but we could manage it. If you click on the presentation mode, hopefully. Yes, just. Just a minute, sorry. Perfect. Now we see it perfectly. Go ahead. Oh, we, we were seeing it perfectly. <laughs> oh. We can go in this way. Okay, but please uh, switch to, to the first slide. Okay. Go ahead. Here we are. 
ok? Ok, so I think I, I can I, I can't see nothing from the stream, so it's very difficult for me to understand what are you I am showing to you. Probably I'm in the first slide, no? Showing my name, it's okay. We are seeing a slide number two right now. Okay, okay, thank you. So I go ahead. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Sorry for the <laughs> some uh, delay. So I'm Roberta Lotti. I am the project and uh, innovation manager officer of the Directorate of Information Systems and Innovation of the Italian Ministry of Economy and Finance. And uh, as ministry, we are the coordinator of the ETAPAS project. It's uh, a pleasure to be here with you. And before to start, let me give a special thanks to Interlink Project for hosting this uh, lively event. So I'm glad to present you ETAPAS that stays for ethical technology adoption in public administration services it is an horizon 2020 project started uh, just a year ago in november uh, 2020 so at the bottom of this slide you can find uh, the links to our projects websites and social media and so please follow us to keep updated on everything we are do doing i trying to you can see the other slide please okay Rob, no you can't see the other no, no we can see number three yes good thank you thank you so now let's talk about etapas so the etapas project is uh, focused on developing a series of uh, practical tools and uh, a first time risk assessment methodology to support public bodies in identifying and mitigate ethical legal and societal risks related to the adoption of disruptive technologies our main goal is to improve the delivery of public services for, for citizens by facilitating the ethical introduction of uh, disruptive technologies, which in the public sector have to overcome barriers due to a number of factors, including the lack of awareness regarding their potential use and, and benefits uh, for public bodies and also the fundamental need to carefully evaluate uh, social and ethical impacts of their adoption on citizens and public workers' lives, also remaining compliant with the ever-evolving European and national regulation strategies and guidelines. So, to overcome these barriers and assess an assessment methodology, to permit public bodies to keep up with innovation and to benefit from that in a secure way is therefore strongly needed. So, to facilitate this assessment, a prototypical technological platform is being developed and the overall framework will be tested on four real scenarios where public bodies will carry out uh, the pilots covering different kinds of public services and dealing with three different uh, disruptive technologies, big data management, robotics and uh, artificial intelligence. Finally, what uh, we expect to achieve with this approach is uh, uh, to enable public bodies to innovate and improve their delivery of public services through ethically responsible adoption of disruptive technologies and most of all, as final aim, increasing the trust of the public on the, these services. Of course, the use of these technologies will hopefully lead to an increase in efficiency and a reduction of costs, in addition to a general increase of security and trust. Okay, so 
to ensure that these ambitious goals are met, ETAPAS Consortium consists of a wide range of expertise in order to maximize synergies and complementarities. As you can see on the map, we have 14 partners from eight different countries, Italy, Denmark, Norway, Greece, Belgium, Austria, Sweden, and France. These partners come from different sectors, including national and local public bodies, research organizations, public services providers, and SMEs, mainly involved in the use cases implementation. We have then technological and research institutes involved in the framework and platform development. And finally, digital innovation hubs to overcome public sector barriers to software development and industrial players with large track records on the digital transition of the public sector. So. Moving now to the core of this conversation, I want to talk a little bit about the link between ETAPAS and the co-production process that is the core at the core of Interlink. Here, I believe ETAPAS can be considered as a co-production facilitator. In fact, when you think about it, uh, using disruptive technologies in a responsible and ethical way means that services, uh, even when developed by external suppliers, must, must be convinced, conceived sorry, with people and their rights at the center, meaning co-production with end users become fundamental. So the ETAPAS approach, in fact, uh, foresee, uh, foresee the engagement or, of final users in order to understand their principles and uh, prioritize actions to mitigate risks that could potentially affect them. Moreover, the project also used this approach during uh, its life so far. For example, uh, to achieve uh, one of uh, our main outcomes, the Code of Conduct, um, we launched a consultation with, with external stakeholders to receive uh, feedback on the code. Uh, ETAPAS also facilitates the alignment of uh, methodologies, approaches and uh, assessment tools for the adoption of the disruptive technologies up among the public, uh, public entities. We know also that the digital transformation is favorable not only for the public sector, but also for the private sector development, in particular uh, SMEs, on which the European Union, Union is uh, investing. So it's clear that the development of both the methodology and the tools to adopt, to adopt disruptive technologies with a human-centric view can be used by the private sector and nothing excludes future collaboration with, between public and private sector in the context of the ETAPAS outputs. Going ahead. Okay. So, now that we get how ETAPAS is connected with the co-production, Let's move uh, to its link with the interlink project and the relevance of production. When looking at interlink, we see a clear alignment as the methodologies and instruments to facilitate co-design and co-delivery currently being developed by interlink can facilitate the etapas and users engagement through a procedure that could help us in a better understanding the requirements, prioritizing action in the adoption of disruptive technologies with a human-centric approach. So I have already said about the relevance of co-production for us. ETAPAS is going to move through a participatory co-design approach, making public bodies work today together and through a co-production between private and public entities. Eventually, what I would like to highlight is that this methodology based on the user rights aims right to put at the center the interests of the user itself, using an approach that 
must engage the final users to foresee actions that respond to risks or threats that could affect them, making this way co-production truly relevant and effective in this in its process. So that's all from my side. Thank you of, again for uh, this uh, great opportunity and uh, also, also for your interest and your attention. Should you have any questions or comments, uh, here you can see my contact information again. So please feel free to reach out and thank you a lot. Thank you very much, Roberta. It is a pity uh, for all of us that we ran out of time, so there is no much time for debate and for uh, commenting on how we could mix uh, the results of Kitapas with the other governance five projects. Uh, I think uh, we have all spotted uh, interesting opportunities. Uh, before we close today, uh, today's session, uh, we will make sure that we all have the email addresses and contacts of each other so that we can follow up from here. I think we should answer uh, one of the questions that was uh, posed through social networks. And uh, this question is related to, to a doubt that they had regarding how Interlink will, will tackle, uh, will, will put in place Interlink, Interlink Wizards. So the, the concrete question, Pauli, if you can please open the, the mic, is based on which criteria do you allocate tasks to AI and to experts under the Interlink uh, Wizard process? This is... Yes. Okay, uh, so basically these help requests raised by the team are not specifically addressed to any of the experts or the wizard specifically. It's an open question that can be answered by one or multiple experts and also the wizard. And obviously in the beginning we have a kind of tabula rasa, no knowledge about, about this decision making recommendation. So, so in the beginning experts will answer the questions and later on when enough evidence have been collected, uh, uh regarding to the topics then then the wizard can also also uh place the recommendations as well so the team can then receive multiple recommendations and choose from them okay thank you very much pauli so i mean I, i'm very sorry but i think uh, we have to close the the session because we had agreed to to be live for one and a half and so it's a bit pity that we have to uh to do it uh, I, th I believe that the recording uh, will be made available for all of you in case you want to review anything. We will also try uh, with a collaboration of my colleagues in the project to share the presentations uh, uh, with each other. And uh, as Robert points out in, uh, in the internal chat, we should organize uh, further exchanges between these uh, projects. Now we know where we all uh, stand what are our objectives. And I think it's very clear that we are very much complementary and there are uh, wide opportunities for our collaboration. So at least from the Interlink point of view and, uh, and coordinated by FDK, for sure we will contact with you again and, and try to establish maybe one-to-one -one meetings uh, between the, the projects to really spot uh, collaboration opportunities. So this is it. Thank you for your time. And I hope that you enjoyed the, the session.